Welcome to the Central Region Tornado Warning Improvement Project module for Land Spout Warning Methods. This first video will cover parts 1 through 4 of the training, while the second video will cover part 5. This module outlines two strategies for handling land spouts. Strategy 1 is to use a suite of messaging options to alert on the potential for a tornado. And we use this when confidence or predictability is low for a tornado. On the other hand, strategy 2 is to issue a tornado warning. And of course, we use this when confidence and predictability exists based on radar trends and environmental cues for a tornado. Ultimately, the main goal of this module is for you to be able to recognize the threat and communicate the risk. So with that, let's get started. Now, land spouts originate from the stretching of pre-existing environmental vertical vorticity. There is no mesocyclone, and these are not supercell tornadoes, although they can occur in association with supercell flanking lines. Let's take a look at the conceptual model of how land spout tornadoes form. The surface map shown here has surface wind vectors represented by the blue arrows. From left to right, you can see that there is a sharp change in the surface winds, which identifies a surface boundary. So let's take out the north-south component of the surface winds, which are represented by the gray arrows. When we bring these components of the wind together, you can see that right along the boundary, there is both convergence and horizontal shear. We can extrapolate this point along the entire boundary and connect them with a brown dashed line that indicates where we have both surface convergence and horizontal shear instabilities. Over time, this laminar shear breaks down into tiny areas of enhanced cyclonic vorticity, which are called mesocyclones. The pink curved arrows highlight the three areas of cyclonic surface vorticity in this conceptual model. This idea falls in line with the research from Wakamoto and Wilson. They use a three-step process to show how land spouts develop. At the initial time step, there are areas of enhanced vorticity or mesocyclones along the surface boundary with cloud development separate from these areas. At a later time, the mesocyclones propagate along the boundary as the clouds continue to grow. In the final stage, if the updraft connects and stretches the vorticity of the mesocyclones, then a land spout tornado could develop. Notice how the mesocyclone labeled C has propagated along the boundary. So let's take a closer look at this last stage and move the cloud from their conceptual model to our two-dimensional surface map. We'll take a cross-section indicated by the green line directly through this setup in order to get a better visualization of the stretching that occurs. This vertical cross-section goes through one of these mesovortices as it faces together with the updraft of a developing cumulus cloud. When this happens, the cyclonic vorticity that originated along the boundary gets stretched upwards. The angular momentum is conserved, so the vorticity tightens and spins faster. If this process continues unabated, a condensation funnel can form at the base of the cloud and persist with the cyclonic surface vorticity. When this happens, it is called a land spout tornado. So keep the conceptual model in mind as you watch this one minute video of a land spout from southwest Minnesota. You may have noticed some debris floating in the air. This tornado hit a construction company shed and pieces of plastic were lifted up into the tornado. Now, no one was there at the time the tornado hit and no one was injured. This tornado traveled a little over a mile and probably lasted around five minutes. So land spout tornadoes are very difficult to detect on radar. The rotation is bottom up since it originates from the vorticity in the low levels of the boundary layer. The circulation is small in scale, which means the ADD is unable to resolve the vortex. The tornadoes are usually short-lived, with lifespans of five minutes or less. And radar often overshoots a land spout, and even if you were very close to the radar, you would likely not be seeing a land spout. They typically occur with a towering cumulus when the precipitation process is still in its infancy. That is why there is very little radar presentation, and seeing the rotation very rarely happens. In summary, tornadic development often precedes radar detection. Let's look at the radar data from the video we just watched. Here's the base of the reflectivity 
and the corresponding base velocity from when the landspout tornado was occurring. The storm of interest is highlighted in the white circle. Range rings show the lowest radar elevation is over 7,000 feet above radar level in this area of the CWA, which reemphasizes the difficulty in detection with these tornadoes. This is a modified version of literature from Davies in 2002. Surface heat axis is indicated by the dotted maroon lines. The trough wind shift is indicated by the red dash line. Now the area of steep low level lapse rates, low LFCs, and low SIN is highlighted by the pink shaded region. The juxtaposition of these three ingredients is circled in the green shaded region, and this is the area that is most favorable for landspout tornadoes. So in summary, there is a slow moving boundary with steep low level lapse rates and small overall SIN. And these landspout tornadoes are most likely where the heat axis and favorable thermodynamic parameters overlap. Now landspouts are not just confined to the plains region. The synoptic conditions along a lake breeze also support the development of landspout tornadoes. A boundary develops as a lake breeze moves inland. This is shown by the blue cold front in the image to the right. Convergence along this boundary with a warm and unstable air mass driven by heating leads to cumulonimbus development. This can lead to stretching of pre-existing vorticity along the boundary and landspout tornado development. Water spouts form in a similar fashion only over water instead of land. So the near storm environment is the key to anticipating land spouts. Notice I said anticipating. Satellite imagery, surface OBS, radar, and even the SPC meso-analysis page are all tools to interrogate the near storm environment. Unfortunately though, the temporal and spatial resolution of these mesocyclones shown in the conceptual model occur on the order of a few hundred meters and last minutes to tens of minutes. Meanwhile, the SBC mesoanalysis data uses a RAP 40 kilometer grid that is updated once per hour. Now with that stated, it can still serve as a tool when trying to diagnose broader regions where stronger shearing instabilities might exist along the boundary and help identify regions favorable for landspout development. So let's refer back to the surface map from our conceptual model and compare it to the surface wind and pressure map from the SBC mesoanalysis page that was valid during our land spout. So ultimately, can you identify the areas of cyclonic surface vorticity? In this case, it's located along the wind shift from southwest Minnesota up through northwest Wisconsin. One of the best mesoanalysis maps that can help you to recognize land spout environments is the surface vorticity and 0 to 3 kilometer cape. In a nutshell, this map shows the potential for stretching cyclonic vorticity, which is exactly what happened where the tornado icon is located in southwest Minnesota. To find the surface vorticity and 0 to 3 kilometer mixed layer cape on the SBC mesoanalysis page, scroll over to the multi-parameter fields and in the drop-down box, click surface vorticity and surface to 3 kilometer cape. As mentioned earlier, these are not supercell thunderstorms, so the typical SBC mesoanalysis fields that you may be used to looking at for supercell tornadoes will be rather benign. For example, the low-level shear and helicity may be minimal on non-mesocyclone landspout days. Here's what the surface to 1 kilometer bulk shear looked like for our event. It was less than 10 knots. Meanwhile, the surface to 1 kilometer storm of helicity was less than 50. This is common during most landspout days. As alluded to earlier, radar data also shows the potential for landspouts. Notice I said potential. Fine lines on the base reflectivity identify boundaries, which show up based on density discontinuities and denote areas of enhanced convergence and vorticity that may be too small in scale to be identified by the SBC mesoanalysis data. That is why it is always good to cross-reference the SBC meso data with radar. Of course, base velocity can show weak rotation, and often that is all you will see. Don't look for a tight couplet because most of the time that doesn't exist with landspout tornadoes, especially when the storm is beyond 30 nautical miles from the radar. Also keep in mind that the 88D is unlikely to resolve compact tornado scale circulations beyond a few miles from the RDA anyway. A spectrum width can be useful for identifying areas of high signal return variability. This can be used to identify potentially small scale circulations that don't fill the beam width entirely, but has to be used in conjunction with everything else. Now, if you're using GR2 Analyst, you may be familiar with normalized rotation. In this case, the normalized rotation was non-existent the entire event. The main point we want to get across here is that rotational velocity and normalized rotation are tools that diagnose mesocyclone strength in an attempt to indirectly infer tornado scale intensity since the ADD can't directly resolve these scales of motion anyway. 
So this leads to a major fail point for both of these indices with land spout events as they obviously don't have mesocyclones. So the goal is that once forecasters recognize land spout environments, they shouldn't be wasting time looking at rotational velocity or normalized rotation to aid in the tornado warning decision making process. So that's it for parts one through four. Please continue on to the second video covering part five.